Gut, ich denke, wir fangen an, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Ich darf Sie sehr herzlich begrüßen zu unserer Theodore von Karmann Veranstaltung. Im Rahmen unseres Helmholtz-Seminars haben wir die Möglichkeit, dass Herr Professor Malmibu heute zu uns spricht, A Short History of Bioelectromagnetism ist der Vorlesungstitel, wie Sie gesehen haben. Und Herr Kollege Malmibu ist eben ein Theodore von Kermann Fellow. Über dieses Stipendium konnten wir seinen Gastaufenthalt am Helmholtz-Institut in diesem Sommersemester finanzieren. Ich darf dann Kollegen Malmibu kurz vorstellen. Giacomo Malmibo hat den Master und den Doktorgrad an der Helsinki University of Technology in Finnland erworben, und zwar in den Jahren 71 und 76 und war danach zwei Jahre in Stanford tätig auf dem Gebiet des, der elektromagnetischen Forschung. Er wurde 1976 nach seiner Rückkehr Associate Professor und dann von 1987 bis 2010 Professor für Bioelektromagnetismus an der Tampere-Universität und hat dort auch das Ragnar-Granit-Institut aufgebaut und geleitet. Er ist, ähm, war Gastprofessor an verschiedensten Hochschulen, auch in Deutschland war er schon mal in Berlin, aber auch an vielen anderen Hochschulen in Kanada und auch in äh, Japan mehrfach. Wir alle kennen sein wissenschaftliches Wirken, nicht zuletzt aus seinem sehr bekannten Lehrbuch und das ist ja auch die Basis für die Veranstaltung, für die Vorlesung, die er in diesem Sommersemester hier in Aachen anbietet. Es gibt verschiedene Preise und Auszeichnungen, die Herr Malmibo im Laufe seines wissenschaftlichen Wirkens erworben hat. Er war Präsident der Finnischen Gesellschaft für Medizinische Physik und Medizintechnik. Gründungsmitglied und Präsident der Internationalen Gesellschaft für Bioelektromagnetismus und Gründer des Journals of Bioelectromagnetism. Er ist Fellow des IEEE. 2008 wurde er zum Ehrenmitglied der Finnischen Gesellschaft für Medizinische Physik und Biomedizinische Technik ernannt und 2012 Fellow der European Alliance for Medical and Biological Engineering and Science. Also, wir haben einen sehr hochkarätigen Sprecher heute bei uns und freue mich, auf Ihre Poesie. Herr Sie haben das Wort. Vielen Dank. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and especially Professor Rau and Professor Leonhardt. I'm very happy to be here in Aachen. It's a great honor to be Theodor von Karman Fellow, and I thank Professor Leonhardt very much for the invitation. It has been a great pleasure to give the lectures to the students. And I have very much enjoyed discussing with the scientists about the research papers, what they have prepared. And I very much hope that this cooperation, which has started and gone very frequent, very, very big activity, will continue for a longer period of time after I leave back to home. It's a great honor to be Theodor von Karman Fellow. I did check from internet that Theodor von Karman was a very prominent scientist. Uh, he was a Hungarian-born scientist, but he was an uh, international scientist traveling all around the world, in the United States and, and in Europe. Uh, I'm very happy to give this lecture, and I gave some uh, proposals to Professor Leonhard about the possible topics for this lecture and he suggested this uh, topic from the selection which I gave, Short History of Biomagnetism. The outline of my talk is the following. I will first speak about some historical remarks, tell about early beliefs on biomagnetism, and then tell our solutions for them especially independence of electricity and electrical magnetic signals, diagnostic performance of both of these uh, uh, methods, spatial resolutions of electro- and magnetoencephalography. Then I give some special applications, some words about the instrumentation, and then final conclusions. 
I start with the history. It was in 1819 when Hans Christian Ørsted, professor of physics in Copenhagen University, experimentally demonstrated the connection between electricity and magnetism. What was his experiment? He had a primitive battery and uh, there was a wire connected between the poles of the battery and electric current was flowing along the wire and as a consequence there was induced a magnetic field which turned the magnetic needle. This was the experiment and it demonstrated that electricity and magnetism are not separate sciences, separate phenomena, they are closely connected to each other. That is the beginning of this discipline. Because according to the basic laws of electromagnetism in connection to the electric current, there always exists a magnetic field. Bioelectric currents always induce a biomagnetic field. For instance, the beating heart generates bioelectric currents, which are recorded as the electrocardiogram. And the bioelectric currents of the heart induce a magnetic field, which is recorded as the magnetocardiogram. So these two phenomena are closely connected together. They originate from the same physiological process, the bioelectric process of the activating tissue. It is surprising how long time in the beginning of biomagnetic research it was uh, discussed kind of separate phenomena like neuromagnetism. There does not exist any neuromagnetism. There is biomagnetism, biomagnetic field induced by the electric activity of the neural tissues. What kind of signals these biomagnetic signals are? All bioelectric signals have a corresponding biomagnetic signal. Their frequency range is quite the same. They look very much the same as the bioelectric ones, but their amplitude is very low. The strongest biomagnetic signal is the magnetocardiogram. It's about 10 picoteslas. When think here is the static field of the Earth, the magnetic field which is uh, rotating the compass needle, and then you go down, there are some, a few decades uh, or, or orders of magnitude are cut off. So here is uh, uh, one millionth of the static field of the Earth, and the uh, magnetocardiogram is below that. It is about 10 picoteslas. Magnetoencephalogram, the other important biomagnetic field, is about uh, one hundredth of the magnetocardiogram. I don't show the other biomagnetic fields. These are the most important ones. They are so low fields that they are much lower than the uh, existing noise fields around laboratory noise, geomagnetic noise, and of course uh, uh, power line uh, 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 induced magnetic fields and so on. So it is uh, really challenging technically to detect these biomagnetic fields because of their very low amplitude and because the environmental noise is so much, much higher. We designed the most sensitive induction coil detector. That is the simplest way just to uh, turn several thousands or hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of uh, turns of wire around the core and to that core is induced uh, current due to the biomagnetic field. That was the most sensitive ever made in the world, which we made in Tampere. Its noise level is about that, below magnetocardiogram. The real instrument for detecting biomagnetic signals is so-called SQUID, Superconducting Quantum Interference Device which is a device which is cooled down with a liquid helium very close to the absolute zero. Our instrument uh, had that kind of noise level and the modern instruments existing nowadays have a little bit better uh, performance. The first biomagnetic signal was recorded by uh, Richard Gerhard Boyle and Richard McPhee in 
1963. It was a magnetocardiogram. They had two uh, ferromagnetic cores having two million turns of copper wire, and there was induced uh, a signal from the biomagnetic field of the heart, and they recorded that. And as I told during my lectures here a few times, the first published magnetocardiogram actually was not a magnetocardiogram, it was its first time derivative. That signal should be integrated to get the real magnetocardiogram. The first magnetoencephalogram, the magnetic field due to the electric activity of the brain, was recorded in 1968 by David Cohen in MIT Boston. And with squid magnetometer he got a bit better uh, signal, which is uh, uh, quite similar as the corresponding electric signal, electroencephalogram. I entered the field in 1972, think 42 years ago. So I'm a kind of dinosaur in biomagnetism. I entered the field in Helsinki University of Technology, which is abbreviated HUT, and actually there is a HUT in uh, close to the Helsinki University of Technology. This building is fully wooden building with no iron. It has only uh, copper nails and so on. It was originally built for geophysical experiments, but we adopted it for biomagnetic experiments. From 74 to 76, I was at Stanford University Department of Physics. I made my PhD thesis there and got my degree from Helsinki. 76, I was uh, uh, appointed to Professor of Bioelectromagnetism to Tampere University of Technology. And here is the first magnetically shielded room in the Nordic countries, which we built in 1979. It is an aluminium room, five centimeter thick aluminium. And the idea is that uh, it uh, shields against AC field, magnetic field is penetrating to the wall, induces electric current, which cancels the magnetic field. Therefore, it does not have any attenuation for static DC fields. Therefore, we had to build a compensating coil system, a Helmholtz coil system. Actually, it was a variation of Helmholtz coils. So I'm very happy to tell in Helmholtz Institute that we had Helmholtz coils there. As you know, Helmholtz coils are basically a pair of coils having the distance, which is the same as the radius of the, radio of the coil. I just tell you that we wrote an article to the Journal of Physics from this room, which we called Tampere Magnetically Shielded Room. The reviewer wrote uh, in the middle of his review that now I find that the name Tampere comes from the city in Finland. It does not mean a shield against strong magnetic fields, meaning terra ampere shielded room. <laughs> I go to the early beliefs on biomagnetism. In the beginning, I, I just entered the field just in the beginning, and in the beginning of biomagnetic research, it was believed that on the basis of the Helmholtz theorem, bioelectric and biomagnetic methods record fully independent information. And it was believed that because of the high resistivity of the skull, which was believed to be 80 times higher than the resistivity of, of brain and scalp, and because magnetoencephalography lead fields are tangential, I show those to you, and EG has better ability to focus the recording. That was believed. Actually, I did believe that also because that sounds, sounds very logical. But both of these beliefs were wrong. And we did demonstrate that. About the independence of bioelectric and biomagnetic signals, I have shown in 1995 that the bioelectric and biomagnetic lead fields are fully independent, but the signals are only partially independent. I return to this issue. And we have shown in 1997 <coughs> that even with a skull resistivity value 80 to 1, magnetoencephalography does not have better ability to focus the recording. And it has been shown later on in, in early 2000 that the resistivity is actually much lower, which makes EEGs relatively better, much more better. I tell now the, our solution for these beliefs. 
I start with a solution for the independence of electric and magnetic signals. I again thank Mr. Helmholtz, Hermann Ludwig Federer von Helmholtz, whom you certainly know very well. Helmholtz uh, introduced so-called Helmholtz theory. I come to this. So the fundamental issue in the clinical application of biomagnetism is do the biomagnetic signals include information which is independent on that of bioelectric signals? If they do not bring anything new, why to use them? If they have some independent new information, that's great. I discussed this issue with the help of the Helmholtz theorem. I show you a few equations, not too many, I just want to show you two beautiful equations. The activating cells, in this case the cardiac muscle cells, act as source elements with current density of Ji, which produce two fields, electric field and magnetic field. If here is some physicist, he or she would say that no, it generates one field, which is the electromagnetic field. And I agree with that, but because we are speaking about very low frequency field and near fields, please agree that we can speak about different electric and different magnetic field. The equations of electric and magnetic fields have two terms representing the contribution of the source, the heart, and the conductor, the inhomogeneities and boundaries of the body. This is the e equation for the bioelectric field and that's for the biomagnetic field. And what is the great beauty here? The great beauty here is that these two equations are otherwise actually identical, except that in the electric field equation there is a dot product and magnetic field equation, there is a cross product. That is the only difference, small but important difference. Helmholtz theorem. <coughs> there are several or, or a few expressions of Helmholtz theorem, all mean the same, but a little bit different uh, way to express it. This is the way how I want to show it. This is one of the expressions. Helmholtz said that a general vector field, which vanishes at infinity, that means that it is a physical field, can be represented as a sum of two independent vector fields. That is a strong word, independent vector fields. One that is irrotational and the other one which is solenoidal. This means that when we have this field of electric current source, a bioelectric current source, Ji. It can be divided to two fields, Jif and Jiv, which are called flux and vortex sources, and Helmholtz says that these are independent. That's a very strong sentence. Looking back to the equations, you can find that the bioelectric signals originate from the flux source, and biomagnetic signal from the vortex source. You remember from the equations, there were dot product and cross product equations. This is a very strong statement. I come to this. What are the flux and vortex sources? They are universal concepts, not specific only for bioelectromagnetism. When you go to take a coffee and pour coffee from the pot to the cup, if you measure how much coffee there is flowing, you measure one dipolar component of the flux source. Thereafter, you stir the coffee with your spoon. If you measure how much it is rotating, you measure one dipolar component of the vortex source. I'll give you another example. Look at the water flowing in the river, in the rapids. The part of the movement which is progress of the water forward is the flux source, and the part of the water movement which is the rotation due to the rapids that is a vortex source. That's it. I give you a third example. This is serious, but please don't take it too seriously. Though we live in three-dimensional world, we have six dimensions of freedom. 
Think a skater. If the skater may glide in the direction of the x-axis. The skater may glide in the direction of y-axis. And the skater may jump to the direction of z-axis. When gliding to one direction, every cell of the body of the skater is proceeding with the same speed to that direction. This is the truth, but this is not the whole truth. Because there's also the rotational movement. The skater may also rotate around the x-axis. He may rotate around the y-axis. And he may rotate around the z-axis. And when rotating, for instance, around the z-axis, every cell of the body of the skater is proceeding along a circular tangential path around the symmetry axis with a speed which is linearly proportional to the radial distance from the symmetry axis. So these are the flux and vortex sources, very close to bioelectromagnetism. There was a strong controversy in the discussion of the independence of ECG and MCG. As I said, I entered the field, field in 1972, and that was the year when my now very good friend and colleague Robert Plonzi, whom I didn't know at that time, published in IEEE Transactions a publication on the independence of electro- and magnetocardiography, and came to the conclusion that since the flux and vortex sources are independent, ECG and MCG are similarly independent, based on the Helmholtz theorem. That was a very stimulating paper. I remember the time when we all believed that, yeah, this is fantastic. When we record the magnetocardiogram, we get as much new information from the heart as we have obtained up to date with electrocardiogram. We believed on that. I believe that also. Then I went to Stanford, as I mentioned. At that time, another famous scientist, Stanley Rush, published a paper in the same journal and from the same issue and came to the conclusion the independence of the flow and vortex sources is only a mathematical possibility. The flow and vortex sources are one to one with each other, which he did mean that the, uh, Maxwell's equations tie them closely together. They are not independent. So it was very confusing time. One prominent scientist said that they are fully independent. Another prominent scient scientist said they are fully interdependent. That was confusing. I found solution for this problem. Uh, what Helmholtz theorem says is that the vector fields of the distributions of the electric and magnetic sources are fully independent. This means that the lead fields of the electric and magnetic measurements are fully independent. However, the electric and magnetic signals are only partially independent. I can show it to you. Once again, our friend Hermann von Helmholtz, he invented the principle of reciprocity and lead field, which I briefly said already, the lead field. I give you some examples. Assume that this is a spherical homogeneous volume conductor, like a simplified model of the head, for instance. If we have two electrodes for measuring the electroencephalogram, their measurement sensitivity is distributed something like this, which is the lead field. I don't go too much to the details. That is a measurement sensitivity of the electric measurement. If we measure the magnetoencephalography, the measurement sensitivity is tangential in this way. If we observe these both lead fields, we find that they are fully orthogonal everywhere. And on this basis, it was believed that electric and bio, bioelectric and biomagnetic signals are complementary. So they are completely new information in biomagnetism. But that is not true. I can show a very simple example. Assume the same volume conductor here is one of those biomagnetic lead fields and one of these bioelectric lead fields. If there is a source element in the direction of the electric lead field, it gives a signal to the electric lead and no signal to the magnetic lead, because it is normal to that. Similarly, 
if there is a source element in the direction of the magnetic lead, it gives signal to that, but no signal to the electric lead. But these are special cases. Most of the source elements are oriented somewhere between, having components both in the direction of the electric lead and in the direction of the magnetic lead. So the electric and magnetic signals are only partially independent. This is the trick. I come to this again very soon. I show you the lead fields of leads detecting the electric and magnetic dipole moments, flux and vortex sources. So when detecting the electric dipole moment of the heart, like the vector cardiogram, we have three leads, X, Y and Z lead, and their measurement sensitivity looks like this. It is linear homogeneous in the direction of the coordinate axis. For magnetic dipole moment, it looks a bit complicated, but it is not so complicated. It is tangentially the measurement sensitivity around each of those three coordinate axes. These three component lead fields are mutually independent. You are not able to synthesize one of those as a linear combination of the two other ones. They are independent. Same holds for the magnetic lead field components. Now I come to the key point. On the basis of the Helmholtz theorem, the electric and magnetic lead fields are mutually independent. Therefore, none of the six components of the electric and magnetic lead fields is a linear combination of the other five. This is what Mr. Helmholtz said, and this is the point. Uh, actually, uh, Stanley Rush was a bit, or, or actually was correct, we can interpret it the other way. In practice, we can make only limited number of measurements and get to know only part of the electric field, usually the dipolar component. From this, we cannot calculate accurately the dipolar component of the magnetic field. Therefore, measuring the dipolar magnetic field gives new information about the source. If we are able to measure the total electric field, then we can calculate the total magnetic field, as Stanley Rush said. So this is the this is the solution for the point. I come to the solution for the diagnostic performance of electric and magnetic measurements. I start with magnetocardiography. We had altogether about 1,000 subjects, patients and normal people, uh, recorded magnetocardiogram, almost 1,000. We made a study where we selected patients having old inferior myocardial infarction, there were 90 patients, old anteroseptal myocardial infarction, there were 71 patients, and normal healthy patients, 152. Uh, the clinical status of the patients was confirmed with non-electromagnetic methods, just to keep these methods separate that we can find their um, uh, diagnostic performance. The total number of the patients was 313, and that you remember how many patients we had. I showed the picture of the Donald Duck's car, which registered plate 313, as you know well. We made a very complicated or detailed analysis with a computerized program. I do not go to the details, it's a long story, but to say it brief. We found that uh, with electrocardiography, we could classify the normals and inferior myocardial infarction patients with the accuracy of 90%. We had the same accuracy with magnetocardiography, about. And when we used both of those methods in the computerized systems, we got the accuracy of 95%. Is that important? It is statistically important and, of course, you cannot go too much over 100, that is clear. So 95 is a good number. Let's put it other way around. The amount of incorrectly classified patients in electrocardiography is 10%, magnetocardiography about 10%, but it comes to combination only 5%, which means that with the combination, the number of incorrectly diagnosed patients decreases to one half, which is quite much. We made very detailed analysis that we first studied how was the 
classification rate for each electric lead alone, using only X lead, we got 72%, only Y lead, 77%, and only Z lead, 87%. They are shown in the order of preference. Then we took two leads to the computerized systems, XY pair, 81%, XZ pair 87 and YZ pair 89 and finally all three leads which is a vector electrocardiography 90% 90.1% as I did show and the same for magnetic leads 91.7 and then we took all the possible combinations you find one electric and one magnetic shown here one electric and two magnetic ones shown here and so on. Finally, three electric and three magnetic ones shown here, 95%. You will see better the result showing it as a graphical form. Now you f find this is unbelievably beautiful illustration. It is true. It looks like it had been uh, made by, uh, by artists rather than scientists, but it is true. It shows that the more you take the electromagnetic leads to the diagnostic system, whichever leads they are, electric or magnetic or whichever, the more you take the leads to the system, the better diagnostic performance you get, which shows that all these 3 plus 3 leads are equal. This equality is shown, seen better if we take the average of all possible cardiac diseases. This is only one disease. We had uh, two cases and that did make it still better. So how can we explain this? The improvement of the diagnostic performance by combining ECG and MCG to electromagnetocardiography is explained in this way. Uh, with this pink circle, I explain or it describes all persons in the study. With the yellow circle is shown those patients which are diagnosed correctly with electrocardiogram and with this blue circle those which are diagnosed correctly with magnetocardiogram. These both circles are about equal. It was about 90% was the accuracy but they are not the same patients. They're equal in size, but not the same, identically the same patients. That's the point. So when combining these two systems, we increase the diagnostic performance of the system. This is the point. They are the same accuracy, but they are not identically same patients. Not totally different, not totally, tot opera, not totally overlapping, partially overlapping groups. Nothing new under the sun. The same phenomenon exists already inside, for instance, inside electrocardiography. If we take only one electrocardiographic lead, we can diagnose correctly those patients, with another lead, those patients, and with the third lead, those patients. And when combining all these three leads, we diagnose correctly those patients, because these groups are overlapping. Same with the magnetic leads. The story goes on, you may guess that it is the same. And combining electric and magnetic, we finally get this result. That's the story. It's always good to have a second opinion. Fortunately, I got the second opinion from the group in Japan with magnetoencephalography. So we did not have anything cooperation with us. They made independent work. Masaki Iwasaki published 2005 a paper on electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography in detecting epileptic spikes. They had 43 patients. EEG system had 23 electrodes and MEG system 122 or 2004 channels. This is typically the case in this kind of comparison studies. It is unfair to compare a system uh, with 23 electrodes and a system with two 10 times more channels, but uh, doesn't matter in this case. They published this kind of picture, which looks very much the same as our pu publication. Uh, you may have difficulties in uh, uh, checking these numbers. They don't really fit, really. It's a very complicated study. These, uh, these are median values, and, and it's, it's difficult. I do not go to the details, but the trick is that these patients are uh, in these patients, the epileptic spikes are detected 
with electroencephalography, with these patients with magnetoencephalography, and in the green overlapping region with both systems on these poor uh, yellow and poor blue only electro and only magnetoencephalography. Here is another way to describe it. Again, difficult to understand this because these are not numbers, these are percentage values, but in principle, these blue results are detected with only magnetoencephalography, these yellow spikes with only electroencephalography, and green ones in both between. So in principle, they found the same behavior between electric and magnetic methods as we first published. So I go a little bit on this combination of information. Uh, just simply think that we have two electroencephalography leads which are identical. This lead and this lead. Both of these EEG leads detect the same signals. There's nothing new in combining them. If you have two orthogonal leads, it is the same as I did show you before. About the same amount of information from both, greatly overlapping information and partially unique information. And on the basis of my previous study, this holds for one electric and one magnetic lead, electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography lead. Quite similar, quite similar result. Because the source in electric and magnetic signals is the same, the electric activity of the brain. If we have more independent sources like in EEG and functional magnetic resonance imaging, then combining the two methods, we get more different new information. I go to the spatial resolutions of EEG and MEG. So as I said, it did sound very logical that magnetoencephalography should have better spatial resolution than electroencephalography. I believe that. We wanted to calculate how much better it was or is, and we were surprised of the result. I show you, here is one brochure of the magnetoencephalography equipment manufacturer in 1994 in one conference. They did claim with this graph that the spatial resolution of electroencephalography is about 20 millimeters, which is correct. But they claimed that spatial resolution of magnetoencephalography, magnetic source imaging, is about an order of magnitude better, about 3 millimeters. But they did not give any reference to this. So they just claimed, so it is an excellent sales promotion, but no scientific reference, no experiment behind that. And that was believed by people who did buy their instruments. We calculated this. Well, it, it's a very big speculation, which is better, which is not, and so on. It's complicated systems may be had. We made a simple study. I claim that this is true, but this is not the whole truth. Anyhow, developed a system called half sensitivity volume. It is the source region the volume where the sensitivity of the lead is one half or more of the maximum sensitivity. If the source is homogeneously distributed, most of the recorded signal originates from the half sensitivity volume. Of course it comes from there where the measurement sensitivity is good. No signal is obtained from that region. The measurement sensitivity is poor. The smaller the half sensitivity volume, the better is the lead's ability to focus its recording. It means the better the spatial resolution. This is the idea of the concept. I show you a graph. Here is a spherical model of the head. Assume that there are, in the brain region, there is, uh, the brain cells are firing electric activities homogeneously all around. That is not the, really the case, but this is such a simplified model. If we have an electroencephalographic lead here, its measurement sensitivity is distributed something like this. This is not accurate. I have pictures on the accurate solution, but it doesn't matter here. Anyhow, the maximum sensitivity in the brain region is here under the electrode. And then we calculate where is the measurement sensitivity, one half of that. It is there. We can actually draw surfaces which bound this half sensitivity region. So in this region, the measurement sensitivity is one half or more from the maximum. 
The smaller is the half sensitivity volume, the better is the spatial resolution. Sensitivity, the smaller the half sensitivity volume, the better is the spatial resolution. In magnetoencephalography, this was the picture which just made people, including me, to think that MEG is better. Because the measurement sensitivity is tangential, lead field is tangential, and doesn't matter what is the resistivity of the skull in magnetoencephalography, because the lead fields don't break the boundary, they are not disturbed by the high resistivity of the skull. Therefore, the magnetic field equation simplifies to this basic equation the contribution of the inhomogeneities and boundaries is cancelled. Unlike in electrocardiography, as I did show in the previous picture, the high resistivity of the skull blurs the lead field a lot. We calculated in this way. We calculated the half sensitivity volume for two electrode EEG as a function of the electrode distance and planar radiometer, which is the prominent system, as the function of the coil distance. We got this kind of results. One single coil has a half sensitivity volume of about 60 cubic centimeter when the inside of the brain region is altogether 2000 and so. As a function of coil distance, here is 180 degrees, the full uh, opposite side and then coming closer, the magnetoencephalography lead half sensitivity volume goes smaller and smaller, much smaller with a radiometer than with a single coil. How is it the electric one? One single electrode, that's surprising, has much better spatial resolution than one single coil. And when having two electrodes, first on the opposite side, of course, a half sensitive volume, or volume is double. Taking the electrodes closer and closer to each other, you find that finally EEG has smaller half sensitivity volume. Let us magnify this so you see it better. This is the half sensitivity volume as a function of electrode distance. Here it is now 70 degrees is the maximum 100 millimeters here. Here are shown the electrode distances in different EEG lead systems. It is used the 80 to 1 ratio. We calculated it also with smaller skull resistivities 40, 20, 15, 10 and 5. And I'm always very sorry that we didn't calculate it for one to one, which had been the lower limit, but doesn't matter. You find that it is believed nowadays that the skull resistivity is about 10, 15 times or the other regions of the head. And then with all distances of the electrodes, EEG is better than MEG. What is the correct number? I say on my lectures, of which ne whichever number you find for the resistivities of tissues, it is wrong. It is, there is no standard stable value, but it is believed that it is quite close to here. I believe those publications made in the beginning of this, uh, this millennium. Let's magnify this. Here is about 15 to 1 or 5 to 1. And here are the electrode distances with a system of 128 electrodes, 256 electrodes, 512 electrodes, and 1000 electrodes. So these two are relevant in high resolution EEG. You see that EEG has better spatial resolution than MEG. Well, uh, when I published this result, I became world famous overnight, but not so much beloved. Uh, colleagues who had bought Magnetoencephalography instruments with a big amount of money. Didn't like that, of course. They didn't want to speak to me when we were in conferences. I went to elevator with them. They just turned back to me. And I, it was very, very confusing. I felt myself like a, like a village mad. But this was not my fault. The result was the fault of James Clerk Maxwell, who wrote so unfavorable equations for the magnetic fields. So this is... Uh, Laws of nature, it is not my fault. This was a releasing uh, publication made in 2002 by colleagues Liu, Dale and Belle Vaux, 
who had in, in uh, Massachusetts General Hospital both EEG and MEG instruments, he, they made simulations and compared previous results and came, referred also to my results, uh, came, came to the conclusion that given to our particular forward and inverse models, our results show that surprisingly EEG localization is more accurate than MEG localization. So this is confirmed by colleagues. <sighs> it was relaxing. I show you some special applications of biomagnetism. EEG and MEG has special properties in the form of the lead fields. If we think about the tangential and radial sensitivities in, in the measurement of the brain, magnetoencephalography has only tangential sensitivity, no radial. Always only in the tangential direction. Electroencephalography, depending on how do we make the measurement, has either tangential or radial sensitivity. This is important. It is a deficiency for MEG, but if you want to measure only tangential components, then MEG gives a possibility. Fetal magnetocardiography is an interesting application. Look at this picture, this photograph. I like this very much. This happy mother was a secretary of the next uh, uh, laboratory in, in our university. Look how happy she is and how much she's smiling when we are measuring the magnetocardiogram uh, of her baby in the tomax. I like this very much. Look, so happy. The signal is very low and we were successful in measuring that. But here is an interesting property. This is a beautiful anatomical picture from 1773. It's like, like an... Uh, portrait an artist's uh, expression of the beautiful lady. I think the, the fetus is in opposite direction here. I think it should be in that way to, to get born uh, more bet uh, better. Anyhow, the heart of the fetus is beating. If you want to measure the fetal electrocardiogram, you just intuitively place the electrode on the stomach and on the back and uh, think that the lead field goes like that and you can measure the electrocardiogram. But that's not the case. There exists, especially on the later phase of the pregnancy, so-called vernix caseosa, a white, cheesy, waxy substance that coats the skin of the fetus in late pregnancy. When the resistivity of the fetus body and the maternal abdomen is about 5 ohmmeters, the vernix caseosa has resistivity of 500 thousand ohmmeters. It is an excellent insulator. Therefore, when having the e e ECG electrodes, the lead field goes around the fetus and it's difficult, if not impossible, to detect the electrocardiogram. But, but, please go back in your thoughts. Remember that the magnetocardiogra magnetocardiographic system has a tangential lead field. This is the same phenomenon like in magnetoencephalography. The lead field goes here around the fetus body and it is possible to detect the electric activity of the fetus heart. The instruments used for this application look like this. Here is a measure the fetus magnetocardiogram with a magnetic method. There are some, uh, here is another uh, show, show another uh, experiment of that. And what is surprising, very challenging technical uh, task, it is possible to detect also the magnetoencephalogram from the fetus. Here are some results. That is an uh, unpolished uh, uh, signal of the magnetocardiogram having the uh, uh, mother's signal here also. This is a fetus, fetal magnetocardiogram. Here are evoked potentials, fetal magnetoencephalogram. Fantastic technology, fantastic technology. The signal is so, so low amplitude. Here is one application, DC magnetocardiogram. Uh, the ischemic heart disease, the disease where the uh, arteries or the cardiac muscle itself are narrowed because of plaque. In resting situation, they don't make harm because they can supply sufficient amount of blood and oxygen to the 
heart. But in stress, the heart is needs more oxygen, and then the narrow uh, artery don't supply sufficient amount of, of uh, blood, and it causes pain in the chest, and in the ECG, the result is seen as a dec decreasing ST segment in this way. This ST deviation is the diagnostic criterion. So you see that ST segment is decreased. Is that the case? This is very interesting. It is not the case, it's the other way around. David Cohan, a colleague again from the MIT, made this kind of experiment with a dog. He measured from the dog the magnetocardiogram. Took the dog under the detector and then off. Then, artificially, he closed the coronary arteries to, co to cause ischemic heart disease, took the dog under the electrode or close to the ma magnetometer and back, and then removed the occlusion and repeated the situation. And what was the result? Here is the first experiment, taken the dog close to the detector and then away, is seen normal magnetocardiogram. Then during the occlusion, what happens? You find that actually the ST segment is on the same line, but it is the baseline between the uh, cardiac cycles, which has risen. And the reason for that is so-called injury current. And then again, the same situation. So the ST segment depression is not an ST segment depression. It is baseline rising. So magnetocardiography gives a better possibility to diagnose this phenomenon. In principle, this can be seen in electrocardiography as well, but the problem is that the electrode contact potential destroys the results, and ECG is difficult, if not impossible, to record DC ECG. But magnetocardiography is possible because it is a superconducting device. That's an interesting application. About this improved diagnostic performance, further studies should be made. So all scientists say that more money is needed. So it is important to find who are these blue people who are diagnosed correctly with magnetocardiography, but not with electrocardiography. And similarly, also with magnetoencephalography and not by electroencephalography. Well, actually, we were stupid enough and we tried to find out who are these people. We carefully tried to find some factor which describes these people, but we didn't find. Why we were stupid? Therefore, that if we had found such a factor, we had not needed magnetocardiography anymore. We had needed only electrocardiography and this factor. So it, it is statistically, they are so distributed that it is not possible to find them. I have some minutes still available, I think. I speak something about the instrumentation. Bioelectric instrumentation. I speak only cardiology and, and encephalography. Of course, there's a lot of other signals. Typically, electrocardiography, ECG signal is strong. It is about one millivolt on the surface of the skin. Electrodes are needed. That may be harmful because they have to be connected. The instrument is easy to transport. You can just carry it on, the, on your portfolio. Shielded room is not necessary. It can be recorded in any laboratory room. And the price is very cheap for electrocardiography instrument. Electroencephalography. Look at this beautiful picture. This is perhaps one or two days old baby here with uh, more than 100 electrodes on the head. EEG signal is moderate. It, it's about uh, 0.1 millivolts. Electrodes are needed. Nowadays, the electrode caps are rather practical. Possible to transport, it is not so heavy. No shielded room is needed, and price is cheap. How about biomagnetic instrumentation? Magnetocardiography. MCG signal is moderate, it's 10 picotesla, where it is very low, but today we engineers are able to measure it rather simply. No electrodes are needed, that's a good point. Actually, no shielded room is necessary. We had a shielded room in Tampere, but it is possible to develop such technologies which cancel the noise that shielded room is not necessary because it is very ex 
expensive and it limits the, the use of the device only to the shielded room. Liquid helium cooled detectors have about 20 femtotesla noise level. It's about possible to use so-called high TC squids which use liquid nitrogen for cooling the detectors. It's just on the limit. I hope they will be developed further because that's much cheaper and much easier technology. And price is reasonable for magnetocardiography. What about magnetoencephalography? MEG signal, it is weak. I will say it is weak. 0 0.1 picoteslas, one hundredth of the cardiogram. No electrodes are needed. That is uh, nice, nice for the patient. Shielded room is needed. In these sales promotion illustrations, the devices are always shown outside the shielded room because the shielded room is so expensive. Liquid helium cooled detector sensitivity is at noise level 5 femtoteslas typically. Price is high. I was just today, I was looking from the Google and I found that in Finland, in Uvascular University, they have just decided to buy a new uh, magnetoencephalography instrument, including 300 channels MEG and 128 channels EEG. Its price is 3 million euros with the shielded room. That's a lot of money. Uh, they are smart, the producers of magnetoencephalography devices. They nowadays, they provide it also with EEG when it is understood that there is no neuromagnetism. It is a magnetic field of the electric activity of the brain. So why not to measure the EEG as well? And when measuring the good EEG, they get good results and they believe that they got the good results with the MEG. So it's kind of status symbol to have in the university an MEG device. Of course, it is possible to detect with the MEG something which is not possible to, to detect with EEG, but it's quite expensive. That's, that's a bit of, lot of money. Biomagnetic instrumentation, magnetocardiography devices are not sold very much. I'm a bit surprised. Here is a cardiomac company in, in New York State, Albany. Uh, they just say that they have sold six instruments. That's not very much. I don't know what is the price of the instrument, but it is not so very much. But this is this is really very, very uh, excellent. Magnetoencephalography instruments. The Electa company, which is an international company, but started originated from the research in Helsinki University of Technology. They have sold these three million euro instruments and systems to United States 18 instruments, to Europe 20, and to Asia, mainly Japan, 23. So 10 times more than magnetocardiography instruments. That's a good sales. I really admire and appreciate that. But anyhow, I have good news. EEG is much better than it has been thought before. It needs some technical development, but it is not so horribly expensive. That's my important point. Magnetoencephalography is quite expensive. It has benefits, a lot of benefits, but it is so expensive that one, if someone has the three million euros, then why not to buy it? But with that amount of money, it's obtained quite much other things as well. So final conclusions. Bioelectric and biomagnetic signals are only partially independent. The diagnostic performance of both methods is, in average, similar. These methods diagnose correctly partially different patient groups. Therefore, combining bioelectric and biomagnetic recordings increases the diagnostic performance. So thank you for your attention and I give acknowledgement of good friend Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. I promise to stop my presentation at 6 o'clock. I did it. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> On the spot. Fragen auf Deutsch oder auf Englisch? Either one. Either one. Okay. So everybody's invited. Have to get better answers in English. Okay. So you can ask in English or in German. Are there any questions or comments on the talk? Bitte schön.
when measuring the uh, resistivity of the skull, um, you showed examples from EG electrodes versus the uh, planar brain gas. I assume you, you also did measure the axial um, graeometers, so do you have results from yes. those as well, and how do they interact? Yes. In my lectures I, I show those results as well. Uh, the axial graeometer is much worse than the planar one. But I intentionally removed it from this presentation to make it a bit short. But it, I, I have the data I can show after the presentation if you, if you want, I'm so, so interested. But it is much worse. Axial gradiometer is much worse. It is the planar gradiometer which is much better. There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or comments? <coughs> I would have a question. What you showed today was this sensitivity regarding sources. Um, when doing measurements, uh, not only sources play a role, but rather disturbances play a major role in our daily life. So what would be interesting if, if there's an issue, if, there, if the same applies for disturbances, like there's different information in both signals, or what happens regarding independence and new information regarding disturbances? Uh, well, what do you mean with the new information on the disturbances? Do you mean that how much the disturbances uh, destroy the new information, or do you? Because we, we are not interested to measure the disturbances, we try to cancel them as much as possible. Yes, but for instance, if I uh, if the problem is how sometimes the problem is how to figure out which is the disturbance and which is signal, and so if I would have a measurement device which reacts differently to both signal and disturbance, I could cancel the one and uh, uh, improve the other one. Okay, okay. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, depends on what disturbances and noise you, 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 are, uh, you worry about. If it is environmental disturbances from outside, of course you can clearly find out what they are when, when not having the patient under the uh, measurement instrument and then you get only the disturbances. Then you cancel them as low as possible. But if you speak about, uh, mean about disturbances which are connected to the biological activity, then that's another point. That's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, in uh, brain studies there's not too much mechanical movement or mechanical uh, changes. So, so there are not such noise elements which noise and disturbances coming <coughs> from the brain. But in the heart, of course, there is some because it's mechanically moving and blood is moving and so on, of course. And uh, one way to cancel those is to cancel the DC magnetic field, the static field of the earth. Then you cancel also the disturbances coming from the mechanical movement of the heart. Yeah, you did not mention uh, movement artifacts. Mm -hmm. Can you... Um, give us an idea of uh, how, in, in a practical uh, situation, how, um, for example, if, if a patient is put into an exercise machine, how, how uh, can you achieve, uh, if there is a lot of movement, how can you achieve magnetic uh, measurements? And uh, you even have a lot of difficulties in the electrical uh, assessment of the activities. Yeah. Well, in exercise ECG, the movement artifacts are minimized by using special uh, leads, which is the mainly the major legal lead system, which eliminates the, the artifacts coming from the arms and legs because the electrodes oh, are, okay. are here closer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it comes some artifacts, I agree. Uh, magne exercise magnetocardiography is not a clinical method just for this purpose. It is a, there has been made some experiments and the experiments are made so that there is a, a bicycle which is fully wooden bicycle uh, or kind of bicycle. Patient is lying on the back and, and biking with the, with the legs. Everything is from wood so that there is no magnetic material. Of course the problem is that the patient is moving a bit which is just a problem which you mean and there must be made some special ways to tie up the patient very strongly to the, to the table for this experiment. 
So it is not a clinical experiment just for these reasons. It is too noisy and too difficult. It has been done just for scientific experiments to demonstrate some issues. Yeah. Again, this, this is um, a, obviously a crucial uh, diagnostic approach because if you have a beginning uh, stenosis in, in some of the uh, arteries, uh, the coronary arteries, um, you increase the stress uh, in order to show when is uh, the uh, uh, occlusion yeah. uh, high enough to make a deficiency in the blood supply yeah. in the periphery of the coronary uh, areas. There are that also can be done with uh, uh, electrocardiographic methods uh, very precisely. There are also other methods to increase the heart rate than to make the patient biking a bicycle. It is possible to uh, have a pacemaker and, and with a pacemaker to increase the heart rate. This is not and, the and there is also a possibility to use some, some pharmaceutical agents to increase the heart rate. So that can be done. Uh, but uh, I agree fully with you that uh, the, I did show the magneto uh, uh, exercise the exercise magnetocardiography because it is theoretically very challenging mm -hmm. thing. But you are fully right that it brings practical problems. You're fully right. Maybe I can add another two questions actually. One is why do we have two orders of magnitude uh, between the magnetic fields from cardiography to encephalography and just one order of magnitude in the electrical world. Is there any simple reason for that or it's just yeah. it's linear, isn't it? Well, that was a difficult question. <laughs> well, um, uh, I can give you an answer, but it is not, not necessarily a correct answer. <laughs> so, well, why, why there is so? It's a uh, uh, one issue that why the uh, cardiac signal is in general, why it is higher. It is therefore that uh, uh, it is synchronized. The activation is synchronized. In the brain, the activation is very, very complicated, going here and there and everywhere. But in the heart, it is going synchronized. Yeah. So that's the main reason for the mm -hmm. difference of the signal amplitudes. Okay, for the amplitudes, I understand that. But the question is, why is it scaling differently? Yeah. I I, I cannot give a, a direct answer to that. Yeah. All right. And the second would be, um, now as you know, we do um, not so, we also are interested in biosignals, but we are also interested in bioimpedance. And not just electrical bioimpedance, but also magnetic impedance. Now, here we do not have the need for squids, which makes day-to-day uh, -day application much more attractive. And yet, if we do transcranial stimulation, which is another thing, um, sensitivity must be an issue here. And I have I never understood if they have large coils on the head and stimulate the whole brain, why this is so specific in its reaction. Could you comment on this? What is the sensitivity field of such coils when they stimulate electrical tissue? I mean, they stimulate everywhere, right? Don't they? Yeah. Well, Can you focus this at all? Well, uh, how the magnetic stimulation is, is focused? Uh, well, from, uh, from the lead fields, well, I have all the data here, but it takes a longer time to show it. But, but uh, uh, the distribution of the stimulation energy in magnetic and electric case is exactly the same as the distribution of the measurement sensitivity. They are exactly the same things which was told by our good friend Hermann von Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the, practically the only difference is the magnetic stimulation that for practical reasons, the mag in magnetic stimulation the coils are bigger than in measuring magneto -encephalograms. So practical reasons, which, because it needs so much more energy. If the magneto would be measured with the same size of coils as the stimulation is made, the sensitivity distribution would be the same. It would be exactly the same. 
so that is the case. Then you ask that why, why the whole, did you ask that why the whole brain doesn't uh, be stimulated at the same time with a coil? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it is possible to make such a coil which, which does that. I hope that they don't experiment that to me. Uh, but uh, with the, the, the prominent system, the, the dominating stimulation system in magnetic stimulation, which is an excellent technology, is a kind of planar gradient. It's a so figure of eight <coughs> coil. It is said it is a coil having two coils close to each other, which is actually a planar gradiometer, which has, uh, uh, from the technologies, the best spatial resolution. It concentrates it just in the middle of the coil, under the coil, the, the energy, and therefore the re area or region where the stimulation takes place is rather small. But if it is used a large coil, and the patient <coughs> puts the head inside the coil, which are made for it, as I next Tuesday I lecture the magnetic stimulation. Uh, I showed the Willis Thompson uh, uh, experiments from 100 years ago, which are quite like that. So the stimulation region <coughs> is much larger. Okay. So may I ask you one question to the vector uh, electrocardiography? Um, X, Y, Z gives you um, a diagnostic uh, uh, power of 90.1. Y, Z. 89.7. Uh, isn't that strange? I always uh, am a little bit suspicious about the vector cardiography because uh, is it is it legitimate to com to, to com compress all the information in one vector? And uh, what is what is behind that? Uh, because uh, you can, for example, if you think about the measurement, you have three electrodes and if you uh, measure two, you can uh, find the vector by adding, uh, calculating the third. Even if it is a little bit uh, uh, a mistake because it is not in one plane, or is it? Yeah. I would like to have the exact number of the amount of information content, content of the lead system and the vector cardiography. They are very close to the same. Very close to the same. The point is that the heart is a very dipolar source and the other point is that it is actually recorded from quite far away. It is close to the measurement electrodes only on the frontal plane but all other electrodes are far away. Whichever is the source Dipole, quadrupole, octopole, or whichever. It is if it is measured uh, further away with a long distance, it always looks like a dipole. You don't see the higher components. So, what the 12 lead ECG records, these precordial leads on the chest, they record a bit something more than the dipolar component, but not too much. But all the other electrodes, record only the dipolar component. So, uh, as I said, I do not have the exact number, which I should have. I would be very interested to know that. But uh, my educated guess and, and, and understanding is that uh, the information content, content of vector cardiography and 12-lead ECG is very close to the same. If you put a multi-lead system to the chest, you can even identify small portions in the periphery of the heart if they have a deficiency in supply, in blood supply. Mm. So there is a lot of information added to the vector. Mm -hmm. So if, the closer you go, the higher spatial resolution you yes. have, yeah. and then you can make detailed um, diagnostic do you have a figure how much more information yes. it is possible to get? Yeah. How I much can is show that? you, sir. Please show me. Yeah. I can include it to my lectures. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any more questions, please? Yeah, I do have another question. Uh, this excellent study you showed where the uh, blind comparison was made, uh, EG versus energy in Japan and uh, somewhere else. 
um, it is really nice, but uh, one could argue that the epileptic spine, so the data provides really strong amplitudes for doing uh, source vocalization. Would you expect the same if, for example, a psychiatrist would measure the cognitive load due to a task and would then make a comparison because uh, epileptic seizures are really strong in amplitude if you measure those? Yeah, well, uh, uh, in, in my understanding of the study which I did show you, comparison of these two technologies was made with epileptic spikes because it is easy to identify that there either is a spike detected or not detected a spike. So, so it is a, uh, the task is simplified. But of course the same holds for every uh, phenomena. But there must be understood that, uh, for instance, magnetic measurement has relatively much higher sensitivity on the surface of the brain and with electric measurement it is possible to make measurements also deeper in the brain. So here is again a difference. So uh, if it is recorded some, uh, let's say, evoked potentials which are quite in the center of the brain, then not too much of those are recorded by magnetoencephalography. Most of them are recorded by electroencephalography. So this is a very complicated question. Whichever I claim in the Congress is, there's always people who are opposed because they, it is so complicated system. So this study by Iwasaki and, and colleagues, I like it therefore that it has the same, it demonstrates the same principle and phenomenon that part of the phenomena are detected with magnetic method, part of them with electric method, and part of them with both methods. So that, that is typical. But it is possible to demonstrate uh, uh, sources which are possible to record mainly with electric and not with magnetic method and other way around. So, so it is so complicated this system. But <coughs> if we take the global average, that's my educated guess, if we take the global average of, for instance, in cardiology, from all the cardiac diseases what the mankind has, all the population what the mankind has, then in average, both methods are equally good. But they detect different patient groups. They are overlapping, but they are not identical. But it's, it's very complicated. So, so there, the reason, there is a real reason to apply magnetoencephalography in addition to electroencephalography, which is the small uh, region of population which is not possible to record with electroencephalography. So that, that is the one which is possible to get with magnetoencephalography. I hope I could answer somehow to your question. Last call. If there's no comment, please. Um, if you just pick up on that point, uh, an epileptic uh, event in the brain is, is a seismic event. Um, the I think basically the discussion here is about two things. One is where the source, where, where your signal is uh, originating from, but also the noise thresholds of the two techniques. As you scale down and want to look at normal brain activity, at some point you'll hit the noise threshold and you won't be able to see those signals about the noise. Yeah, well, with the, with the modern magnetoencephalography equipment, the noise level is so low that, uh, that in this kind of issue of epileptic spikes, they are equal electrical magnetic But for instance, in, as I said, in the evoked potentials, they are so much smaller and the sensitivity, measurement sensitivity, relative sensitivity is even much smaller for magnetic measurement. So it is measuring only noise. So this is, we can speculate this whichever way we want. Yeah. But for for a cortical signals, like in the in the picture which I did show for the first magnetoencephalogram of David Cohen, the alpha rhythm recorded by the squid magnetometer did look equally clean like with the electroencephalography. So the quality is, is comparable. But for deep sources, it is much better. And for tangential sources, 
certain EEG lead is equal as magnetic lead if the sensitivity is normal to the source, whichever it is magnetic or electric, then it is not recorded. Depends on so so many things. Okay, dann denke ich, sollten wir unseren Gastredner mit einem donnernden Applaus verabschieden und uns herzlich bedanken. Ihnen allen vielen Dank, dass Sie gekommen sind und einen schönen Abend.